Hi, I'm Adam Wheeler. I'm a grad student here at Columbia in the Cool Worlds Lab, and today I'm going to talk to you about my research on finding the truly weird signals lurking in astronomical data sets. In today's video, we're talking about weird signals. So let me just first start by talking about why we would even want to look for these things. Astronomy, and science in general perhaps, is often driven forward by the unexpected discovery of new phenomena. To give an example, in 1610, Galileo discovered that Jupiter was orbited by three smaller bodies. Now we call these the Galilean moons. And today we don't necessarily think of this as unexpected or weird, but at the time it was revolutionary. Uh, because these were the first heavenly bodies that unambiguously did not orbit the Earth. Four and a half centuries later, in 1967, Jocelyn Bell Burnell and Anthony Hewish discovered something else new. They were taking radio observations, and they kept seeing pulses every 1.33 seconds. These signals were so unexpected that they were half-jokingly dubbed Little Green Man 1, or LGM-1. It turned out that it wasn't aliens, but it was actually the first radio pulsar, which is a, a highly magnetized, rapidly spinning neutron star. The field of exoplanets has also seen its share of surprises. When we first started discovering and characterizing exoplanets, we were shocked by the number of Jupiter-sized planets really close to their stars. These are called hot Jupiters, and they're typically about 10 times closer to their stars than Mercury is to the Sun. At the time, this totally defied any formation theories, and it's only now that we're able to kind of start explaining them. More recently, you've perhaps heard about Oumuamua, the first interstellar asteroid, or Boyajian star, which is a star that's behaving unlike any we've ever seen before. And you can watch videos about that on this channel. Clearly, looking for the weird is worthwhile and can lead to great scientific advancement, but most of those examples I just told you about involved humans looking at the data. As we move into the era of millions and eventually billions of objects being surveyed, it's just not possible for people to examine all the data manually. So you need a more algorithmic approach, and that's what we're trying to do with this new paper. So now let me talk a bit about how the algorithm works. To do that, I need to first talk about the data for a minute. Kepler, as you may know, was a space mission designed to detect exoplanets via the transit method, which is covered really well by other videos on this channel. But to explain it briefly, Kepler detected exoplanets when they passed in front of their star, blocking a small fraction of its light in a repeating and predictable way. And this is how we've detected the majority of exoplanets that we know about today. It was a very successful mission. And the data from Kepler is what we're working with. It's the brightness of all 200,000 or so of these stars that Kepler monitored over the course of four years. So looking for planets in this data is straightforward. You just look for repeating box-like dips. But what about the truly weird? That could be quite different from a box. In fact, it could look like just about anything. Now on some level, as I've explained it so far, this isn't even a well-defined problem. What does it mean to look for something that you're not expecting? How can we be prepared for that which we do not know? But I do know that we are ready to encounter it. Really? Yes, absolutely. That's why we're out here. One of the big assumptions we make is that whatever we'd like to find is repeating over a regular interval. That's called the period. If you have a light curve, the brightness of a star over time, and a conjectural period, you can do what's called folding the light curve, which is where you reorder the data by what part of the cycle they fall on. If you get the period wrong, you've basically just scrambled the light curve randomly and you'll get back a jumbled mess. But if you fold on the period on which something is actually happening, then that signal will pop right out. And that's how the algorithm works. It tries folding a light curve over many, many periods to see if anything pops out. If you get the period right, not only does the signal become evident visually, but the data points will actually hug closer together. They'll follow a tighter curve. There's a whole second component to this as well, which is that not all repeating signals are interesting. Particularly, lots of stars, most stars are rotating. And if they have dark spots on their surface, like sunspots, then as they rotate, sometimes that spot will be in the back of the star, sometimes in the front, and its brightness will vary in a predictable way. 
This is really common and we don't want to flag signals like this, so there's also some math that goes into removing them. So we took our algorithm and we applied it to all of the Kepler data. One of the things it flagged was Boyajian star, which is great, that's exactly the kind of thing we want to find. We were pretty sure that there was nothing as dramatic as another tabby star still lurking in the Kepler data, because a lot of people have been looking at it for years, especially the citizen scientists at Planet Hunters. But the fact that we've flagged it in the Kepler data means that if there's something similar in other data sets, say TESS, we have a good chance of being able to find it there. We flagged a lot of known planets as well, which is encouraging, as well as some new stuff, which looks like this. We're pretty sure that these are instances of what's called heartbeat tides, and that name comes from the fact that they sometimes look like echocardiograms. Heartbeat tides happen in a binary system where two stars, generally called the primary and the secondary, orbit each other. Particularly, they come from eccentric systems where the orbits of these stars are very non-circular. The basic story goes like this. The stars spend most of their time far apart, but then they briefly come close together. And when this happens, they exert tidal forces on each other, just like the Earth and the Moon. Just like the moon distorts the surface of our oceans to be less spherical, the stars distort each other and they become slightly non-spherical. Then from our point of view, they can look slightly larger or smaller, which means brighter or dimmer. These are really cool, but I think the real potential of the weird detector is in future data sets to look for the next Boyajian star. I also wanted to share with you something else that we found. It's not of great scientific importance, but the process of figuring out what was going on was really fun, and I think it's kind of interesting. Despite the fact that we designed our algorithm to look for repeating things in the data, because of some of the details about how it works, we also found events that happen once. Five of these looked pretty similar. In all of them, the light from a star went up and then back down smoothly over the course of a few hours. Most of the time when a star gets brighter, it's because it flares, but these don't look like stellar flares. Stellar flares rise very quickly over the course of a couple minutes, and then they fall down exponentially, but these signals look symmetrical. So I read up about stellar flares, and it turns out that for very active stars that flare a lot, often they happen one after the other in quick succession. That's called a complex flare. When that happens, the light curve doesn't necessarily look like a regular flare because they're all overlapping and making a new shape. And that explanation works for one of these five stars. One of them flares a lot over the four years that Kepler looks at it. It's pretty active, that makes sense. But the other four are totally quiet except for this event. Another thing we briefly considered is microlensing. So microlensing is a form of gravitational lensing, which is a general relativistic effect, where mass curves space-time, and then when light passes close to it, its path gets curved. When a small, massive object passes close to your line of sight as you look at a star, sometimes more light than before gets directed into your instrument, and it looks like the star gets slightly brighter. That's what's called microlensing. And microlensing signals often look like these signals that we found in Kepler, but that explanation doesn't work either, because there's just not enough stuff in between us and the Kepler field to do this microlensing. It's vanishingly improbable that this would happen. I was puzzling over this when I realized something unexpected. All four of these signals that aren't the complex flare happen within 40 days of each other. And immediately that tells you that the signal isn't coming from the stars themselves. They're too far apart to be causally connected like that. Instead, it has to be originating from within the solar system. So that's when I made this plot. The stars that have these events follow a path on the sky. The extra light we were seeing was not coming from these stars, but from a comet in the solar system that was contaminating the observation. Anyway, the comet is called C2006Q1, and we weren't the first people to see it, or even the first people to see it in the Kepler data. There's at least one paper from 2014 where they also note that comets sometimes come through and contaminate Kepler's observations, but it was one of the most fun parts of working on this project, so I wanted to share that with you. Thanks for tuning in to hear about my project on the WEIRD detector. We're looking forward to applying this to test data soon, so stay tuned for news in the future. Let me know if you have any questions down below in the comments, and make sure to subscribe to our channel for all the latest videos.